I talk to sports psychologists and psychologists and what can I do and what's the, what's the ways to get these red light thoughts out of my head. And it's crazy. Cause I sit back now and I can, it's easy to do, you know, it's, it's, uh, I do a lot of snowmobiling now and a lot of mountain biking. Like if you're hauling ass down a run and you're like, don't hit the rock, don't hit the rock, don't hit the rock. You hit the rock. You're going right? to hit the rock. Hit the rock. If only we could address life like that, like hit the jump, hit the jump, hit the jump, hundred foot, bang, bang it. Good. You know, if you could just think in positive thoughts all the time, it'd make things so much better and easier, but you don't, your mind works so weird. It's always, always the opposite. Like if you're on a, on an icy road, you're like, don't hit the brakes. Don't slide. Don't slide. Don't. And then, then you go slide into the ditch. But if you're like, fucking let's go rally, 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 right. You take the corner. Gas just, on your gas good. on. Let's go. It's just weird how, <laughs> how your brain works. And we are live in live. Studio M, Monster Energy Unleashed. Always here, Danny Cast, two-time Olympic silver medalist in the house. Hello, hello. Gray hair flowing. That's right. Hit 40. It's starting to pop out. And as always, Brittany Palmer. How you doing, Brittany? I'm good. Thank you. And today's guest, Donald Cowboy Cerrone. <laughs> Crowd goes fucking Woo! crazy. Woo! Uh, set the most records for most finishes, 15, most wins, 21, and most fight bonuses, 16. Mm. Holy shit, that's a pretty good record there. Yeah, the bonuses helped the bank account a little bit, for sure. Yeah, well, what's the bonus about? It's for the performance bonus. Uh, so if you, it used to be if you had a submission or a knockout, or then they change it to a performance base where if you went out there and put on like one hell of a show, they'll give you an extra bump. And it used to be a hundred grand and then they kind of scaled it down. What's it now? It's 60, 60, maybe 20. I don't know what it is now, but uh, every time you ask a question about UFC, Brittany's <laughs> answer is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I've double bonus. A couple where you've I like never got a performance. bonus. So <laughs> I'm sure you got a couple bonuses in there. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll stop. Um, <laughs> fuck, man. You were one of the and probably the most exciting, you know, uh, you know, a fighter and especially American. You kind of became this like American icon, you know, like you were you're like uh, coming from Colorado era. But then, you know, creating, you know, what you created in New Mexico with the BMF ranch and then kind of becoming, you know, the cowboy, the, the, the hat. The working the, man, the yeah. working man's guy. Start, you know, taking care of the working class. Yeah. Uh, we have a few videos here. We're going to sc screen of uh, some of Donald's knockouts. This was 2016. And um, you were very good at knocking people out of your feet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed kicking. That was my, my favorite thing to do was kick. Because you kind of started as what well, started as, as as street fighting. Correct. Yes. Uh, and back then, when I was street fighting, it was one of those things that was okay. You know, like you get in a fight, the parents of the kid would come over and you'd kind of work it out, or the cops would be called and they'd be like, "Go home, go home." And it's not like it is today. So I don't. You don't you know, condone it. I don't condone kids to go out there and street fight. No, that is it's not like it used to be. What? Um, and then, uh, well, I, I used like because now it's maybe people pull a knife or a gun or. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little, or it's a little they've, different now. Or they've trained at the gym and they're actually yeah, judo they're, masters. And, and you, you don't want to just mess with anyone these yeah, days. Yeah, all of a sudden you're thrown through a window. So you don't want that. Yeah. No, you don't want that. Um, and then it, you, when did you start actually kickboxing? So again, I got in a fight, met some buddies of mine and a street fight. And they asked me, hey, you, you enjoy this fighting? Come try this kickboxing thing out. Tried it out. Two weeks later, took my first fight. Traveled the world and I uh, literally have fought on every continent except for Antarctica. Really? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, I've been to 160 countries. I think there's only like 172 countries out there. So they're missing a couple, but. And you've almost fought in all these countries or just visited? No, 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 no. Just okay. I visited them. Yeah, gotcha. but I fought definitely on every continent. As so I remember, I think it was during COVID maybe or whatnot. I mean, you fought like three times in. I remember seeing your name on the card like within a really short amount of time. I feel like. There a period there, or any period of your career, maybe you would never say no. Yeah, I mean, talking during COVID, the the thing that was cool about the UFC, they were kind of the front runners of the whole, um, you know, let's 
let's figure this out and create the bubble and get get sports back in action, you know? And now you look back at it now and you're like, God, what a stupid thing we were all doing. <laughs> <laughs> stupid. Why, 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 why stupid? I just mean the way that everyone, how they did the just two weeks, they two weeks you to death. Two weeks, two weeks more, two weeks more. Now we're two years in and it was just, it was just a funny experiment that uh, went terribly wrong, I think. And Right. Yeah. Um, so you think if you were to do that over, a... oh no, it wouldn't happen again. The, the, there's there's too many uh, there's too many right wing radicals that are gonna be like, nope, I ain't doing that. Not yep. happening. Not happening. So you couldn't force that upon the people again. But like, I thought it was cool that UFC. What Dana did is they they like they were like, well, this is an opportunity to bring this entertainment and give you guys something to do. Like I was, I remember I wrote, I raised my hand for that. I was like, Dana, I'll do it. I am not afraid. Let's go. And I ended up living in Jacksonville for, you know, a yeah, month. We, we drove the RV down. Huh? Mm -hmm. And it was funny. As soon as you like cross through the Midwest, you're like, oh, wow, people are mm -hmm. kind of normal over here. It's mm -hmm. not, not as crazy. And you get into Florida and it was full on Western down there. They did not care. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> but then like all of us going to the bars and like, we'd been kind of cooped up. So when we're all like, traveling and all of us coming from all these different places and we're all in the bars we're just letting loose it was that was fun yeah well those times are kind of over too florida like didn't really shut down at all no it, they, they, that's what i'm saying they were like no nah, we're good, we're good. <laughs> no we're good well it's also like a hundred degrees out you don't want to be wearing a mask and and at a bar yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to meet ladies if you're wearing a mask at the bar. You know? Yeah, it is. It is a little. Um, you've been doing a, a lot of can amming off roading. You did a. You recently did a competition. Yeah, so I've uh, the last couple of years been racing uh, in the desert, and I love it. It's, it's uh, unbelievable. My son actually was the youngest kid ever to compete in the Mint 400. He's four years old, raced his first car, and uh, it was funny trying to explain that to the directors, and they're like, "You have to be six years old to." Do it and i was like yeah but what if he can drive like what if he can pass all the tests and they're like if he can do it he can do it so they kind of lifted the rules and let him uh let him go race because i saw him uh, uh didn't it, didn't you build like some block for him yeah oh yeah for the pedals yeah huge, <laughs> huge pedal extensions yeah oh yeah the car i mean the car is safe and it was funny because just the other day our his cousin came over and he's six and jumped in the car while my son was driving and his dad was like wait a second like this doesn't seem safe. I said, oh yeah, he's the best four-year-old driver out there. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> he's the number one four-year-old in the world. But they want to jump on quads. I was like, think about that. Like they're going to be in a cage, fully six-point harnessed in. Like they're good to go. So once he's seen everything was safe, it was good to go. Good to go. Good to go. Four-year-old, clear to go. Clear to go. Got to start him young. <laughs> um, you grew up uh, uh, You grew up in Denver. You grew up in the freezing cold. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Cold's... Mm, just I'd, I'd prefer cold over hot do you think day. cold makes you tougher no no I, I don't think so no no hell no i'm still a big wuss so <laughs> yeah i don't like being cold cold like that like the only reason i like being cold now is getting on a sled and going playing and like when people are like it's three degrees and we're in our sled gear like so what it's perfect but if i was three degrees uh hanging out no i'd be bitching like let's get a heater going yeah, where uh, where do you go sledding? Because there, there is, there's no sledding in New Mexico, right? No, or, we're we're kind of right on. The, I go to the Colorado border, which is Pagosa Springs and Wolf Creek, which yep. is some of the best natural snow out there. It's un, unreal. Yeah, they're getting hammered right now. So as soon as I go home, loading up the sleds and we're going to play back out there. Back out. Yeah, we've had kind of a crazy. It just won't stop snowing. It's mm -hmm. snowing in the mountains here right now. Um, uh, since retiring, uh. You know, you've been obviously working on movies and doing other stuff. Do you feel like are you uh, having such a long career? Have you uh, struggled trying to move into like new fields or doing new things? Does it does it feel weird or you're kind of found like your stride? Yeah, no, not at all. I always knew when I was going to turn the corner and not look back, you know, and everyone's like, you still miss? Of course I miss. I miss the camaraderie of the hanging out with all your fellows, fellow friends and training partners and all the coaches and on one mission, on one goal, you know, but – yeah, life takes a new door, and uh, now we're chasing down Hollywood. Yeah, and how's that going? I'm loving it. I just met with a new uh, manager yesterday, actually, so should be good. Have a couple fun movies in the books, and uh, it'll be it'll be fun. It's and a lot of fun. I saw that you're directing too. No, no oh, you're no, not. No, no, no. They just sometimes when you uh, help out on movies, they add that, and you get like that credit. But I'm not chasing that credit. Right, you're just kind of acting. Yeah, loving acting. It's 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 pretty interesting, and we've talked about this before. Um, uh, you know, with MMA fighters in general, you know, it's it's 
you guys are so kind of authentic and I think it's a, been a perfect fit for MMA fighters to transition into acting, whether it start as um, uh, uh, being a stunt you know, fighter or whatnot, but then moving into the acting roles, people trying to betray people like yourselves, it's easier just to put the real thing in there. And I think that MMA's had more than any other industry, I think more success in uh, fighters going into acting careers. Right. I mean, we don't have to portray the image of when you're acting, you, they try and like embody that whole role. So if you were going to go try to be the tough guy, first of all, you have to pretend to be the tough guy. I think we already have that part nailed. So we don't have to add that in. No. <laughs> yeah. You get to really kind of be yourself, yeah. but then also kind of mold into you know, that kind of character. And that's what I was talking to my manager, my new manager yesterday saying, I don't want those roles. I don't want the beat him up, knock him down roles. I want you know, like the rom-coms and the comedies and the like, like, like shift gears and get away from that. Play, play something out of my wheelhouse. Are you doing like anything with acting coaches or like, how is your auditioning process or? I, I probably should, but I want to thank Dave Schaller and all the guys at WC for putting us in the camera and teaching us how to speak mm -hmm. and how to be in front right. of the camera and be in front of thousands of people all the time. So it kind of like helped a lot. Like I don't get in front of a camera like, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Right. You're right. kind of confident. Very straight confident, off the bat. yeah. And I have a weird memory. I can look at a page of dialogue and kind of. So you don't struggle remembering lines? It depends on, sometimes there's words in there I don't remember. So as long as the director's like, there's the meat and potatoes. Say it how you think your character would say it. I can nail that. That's what I, if mm -hmm. I, if I ever had to act, I feel like that's what yeah. I'd have to do. I mm -hmm. would like bullet point, like what you've got a bullet yeah. point, but there's no way like I can't, sometimes when I'm hosting or hosting something where you've got to have a piece of paper and once you're kind of live, you're kind of like, fuck, like, and you kind of just, I can ramble, mm -hmm. but remembering something line word for line, word. Yeah. impossible. Well, it's because they're writing it in their voice and your voice is what makes it yours. So when you're like inauthentic, then it just comes off. Yeah, make it your own. Yeah, make it your own. Um, have you, uh, w w with your um, kind of, you know, finding a new manager or finding the right team in this, have, you know, obviously you want what you want and they're like, well, no, maybe like, you know, you can just be the, you know, the tough fight guy, but you're like, oh, no, maybe I want to play the outside role. Have you struggled with people saying, no, we don't want you to do that? No, because they work for me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and that's what people don't understand, especially in MMA, like they don't realize like your manager and your agents and everybody, they work for you. So yeah. Fuck them. This is what you want. This is what you. This is the direction you want to go. So maybe they can spin in like maybe that's not how we want to go. But when you, like I'm, you're almost forty. I'll be forty in a couple of days. It's like once you reach this age in our life, we're like, nah. I know who I am, and this is what I want to do. So fuck you if you don't want to come with me. Yep. Uh, any big movies that are in the works now? Uh, well, I can't say, C but yes, it's cool. Yeah, yes, yeah. They're real weird about that. You can't take pictures on set. You can't. They're really weird about speaking about it, talking about it, doing. Like I have a really cool one coming up. I wish I could uh, say something about it, but it's it's. Uh, they're all on their wraps with it all. Well, congratulations on that. Thank that's, you. Uh, that's really awesome. So you joined UFC in 2010. Um, you were fighting in the World Extreme Cage Fighting, the WEC -E promotion. Uh, how much has fighting changed since then? Well, it was funny when we were in WC and, and like it kind of um, they took it over and they slowly started bringing fighters. Over. I think they brought the heavier weights over first and then they brought the lighter weight guys and they're like, oh, these guys are going come over and get destroyed. And then there's I want to say there's only well, now that I'm retired, there's only a couple of yeah. guys, WC guys. But we came over there and made waves. You know, we were like, no, we're not just the guys you're going to just beat up and send us on the way and put us in the washing machine. Now nah, we're we're here to stay. And. Crazy thing about UFC, it's a machine, man. People don't realize that either. Like, there's all they want, their dreams and their aspirations are, I want to be a UFC fighter. Like, how about you change it to, I want to stay a UFC fighter. I don't want to just make it to the big show. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. like staying there, oh my, I'm sure it's with, like, with snowboarding, you were talking, like, getting to the show is tough, but being able to stay there time, year after year after year and and run with the with the top dogs, that's, that's when you really got to buckle down. Yeah, and when you see the whole new crops come in, in a way, right, where you're like, wow, okay, I've been doing this 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. And you're like watching all your guys you went in with kind of out. And you're like, all right, now I'm going to kick some young ass. Well, you think you are. And, well, they're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, they're, and then they're young and they have the super, you're like, super human strength. I just punch like, this guy 10 times in the head. He won't go down. Yeah, he could train He could train six hours a day and it takes you 20 minutes to warm up just to get out of bed. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a different game. The young man sport for sure. But I mean, there's got to be a lot of... Uh, like what you learn coming up into it is what makes you a veteran, right? Like, oh yeah, helps you in that split moment how to like, okay, this is where I'm gonna go, 
Well, as you know, with in snowboard, there are certain things that you did along tour and along the way that you already have the answers for. They don't know yet. They don't know yeah. the idea of checking in the hotel and and where to go here to there to there and make everything work. But you have already done it fifty times. So in you, you're like, oh no, you don't want to do that. And they're like, but why? And you're like, well, you know what? Go do it. Figure it out. And then come back to me like, yep, you don't want to do that, right? So it's that's the veteran side, and it's cool to sometimes grab these kids and try and explain it to them. But a lot of people don't learn from others. They have to burn their hand. You have to tell me that's hot. I got to put my fucking hand on it and burn like, yep, that was hot. Why didn't you tell me? Oh, I did. Yeah. Right. So that's a lot how people learn. And is there any like fighting styles that are like that where you're like, well, you don't want to spend too much time on that one wrestling and you want to spend all your time on it. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, all of it. That's, that's the, if you're a good striker wrestling dictates, if you want to keep the fight standing, or if you're a great jujitsu guy, wrestling dictates, let's take them down. Right. So the wrestling is definitely the, I mean, you see all these these uh, guys from overseas that are just controlling the. Well, it was like Khabib's whole career, right? Yeah. It was like you knew he was probably going to win, but it was going to be boring. Yeah, but it's not. I mean, if from the outside looking in, you could see that's boring. But if you're looking at it from a wrestler or a jujitsu or a controlling point of view, that's not boring. He's right. doing everything he can yep. to make that guy either tap because he's just getting smothered or. But, but from the outside, from the guys that wanted to see someone get knocked out, yeah, it's a boring fight. But from a, from a standpoint where you're like, wow, he is making that guy unable to do anything and call uncle that, you know. But like GSP as yeah, well. Right. Like yeah. it's not the most exciting fight. But if you actually look at how technical they are, they are and how hard that really is, that's what makes it really powerful. Yeah. But speaking of, we have a question here from Crispy Carito. Anyway, Crispy Cowboy, <laughs> <laughs> what is the biggest tip for starting kickboxing? Oh, 10,000 hours at every move you want to be great at. Yeah, because 10,000 hours of, of, of jabbing and kicking and learning to knee and, and how to how to properly throw a kick just gets you good at something, not near the level you need to be in the great, right? So, yeah, just practice and practice and do it southpaw and then do it orthodox and do it southpaw and, and have your pad guy hold the pad 500 times with your right kick. Learn your low kick. So if you're learning to start kickboxing, I'll try and first figure out which – stylistically is my best because maybe the way I teach you to kick is not the way that your body moves. So finding the proper coach that can work with your style, that's, that's step one. And you used to, I mean, I remember, I, I know all of the, the fighters and your schedule, you would go in two a days, sometimes three a days, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, and I used and to all different too. You would do strength and conditioning. Then you would go into your pad coach. I mean, you, and you talked about GSP and I learned cool things from him at, bringing me under his wing. I used to go up to Montreal and train with him and he would always do one discipline a day. And I never understood why, like, why wouldn't we do our strength and conditioning, which isn't really discipline, but, and then why wouldn't we go do MMA rounds and then maybe hit pads? And he was like, man, I just like to work. If today's wrestling, all three of our circuits are designed around wrestling. So our strength and conditioning is wrestling muscle group designed and we'd go drill and then we'd go in on. So it was really nice to learn that. And, and I developed that into my training. Like every day was one discipline that we'd work on, which was, I think he had it figured out. So I was like, man, I'm going with Chamber, right? Yep, that, with Chamber, yep. Yep. I trained with him. Yep. There you go. In Montreal. How um uh Pizza Bear 686 says, what's your funniest fight in your opinion if, that you can remember? Funniest. <laughs> uh probably WC, a guy named uh Ed Ratcliffe. I kicked him in the balls three times. <laughs> Trying to low kick. But you're allowed to there? Or oh, no. <laughs> no. No, no. I got deducted points, deducted points. And I, I was like, there's, it was, I had, at that point, I remember going back to my corner, like, you have to finish this guy or we're not winning this fight. And it was just funny because I'd low kick, try an inside leg and just right, just full box kick. And I'd be like, oh, man. And how long would he go down for from a ball he was, kick? He was pretty honorable about it. He would take really? it. And kind of like look at me like, God damn you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and then we come and touch gloves like, man, I'm sorry. Then I did it again. And I'm like, oh, hey, man, I'm still sorry. You know, so yeah, yeah. To, between the two of us, that's the comedy was like funny for me because I was just like, oh, man. Like you had that look when you touch gloves again. Like, man, yeah, I did that again. And that was intentionally, you know. And yeah. uh, so it was fun. <laughs> um, you fought uh, a lot of, you know, the A-listers from McGregor, Raphael, Leon Edwards. Like what's one of your highlight fights or one of the highlights from fighting uh, oh man, probably the fight that I always looked up and was excited about was Robbie Lawler. You know, at the time when I fought him, he was he was a veteran. I think he's still around right now, still today. I don't think he's retired yet, but I he, think he's still he still is. He, he fought he's, last he's, year. He's still, still <laughs> my man, Robbie's still doing it. So, um, 
that to me was like, oh, I'm going in to fight a guy I used to watch and admire and here we go. So it was, to me, that was, that was probably one of the highlight other than fighting uh, Razor Rob McColl in WC. That was probably the toughest fight I ever had. I knew that was going to be a back and forth, just a barn burner. And it was, um, obviously John Jones, you had like some good comments on John Jones coming back and fighting sure. at, at, uh, that weight. How, um, you know, obviously he's, you know, probably is the best fighter oh, of sure. all time. For sure. And it's amazing to me how you have one guy on one side and one guy on the other. And the guy on the, on the left side does everything right. Trains, eats, sleeps, has the dietitian, everything, everything he could possibly do right. And then you got the other guy on the right side that just, it's just a God-given gift, you know, and he can just go out there and not pay attention to his diet, train whenever he wants. I mean, I'm sure John still trains very hard. Like, don't let that fool you. But he can get away with a lot more, you know? And then they just go out there and he beats these guys were on their strong suits, which is incredible. Like, I knew John coming back after everyone's like, oh, a couple years ring rust. Like, nah, he uh, he's going to – he actually won me a whole lot of money, a whole pocket full of money on that fight, so it was good. It must be – I didn't know you were a betting guy, but as a UFC fighter, you're not allowed to bet, right? Oh, yeah, but I'm no longer a UFC that, fighter. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, I do pretty good betting. I mean, I know all these guys personally. Yeah. So the people I bet on um, – yeah, like Gaethje, I knew he was going to win that fight. Yep. Um, JoJo, I was, she, she just won last weekend. I, I bet on her, but I was, eh, she's my girl. She's cool. I like her. It was more of a, that's my friend. And she went out there and won. But the fight that I lost on was the Edwards and uh, Usman fight. And not taking anything away from Edwards, he's very skilled, very good. I just thought Usman was going to make some changes and come out hungry and pissed off and want to get his title back. So, um, that's that's all I have to say about that. But yeah. Yeah, he seemed a little nervous. Right. I mean, this is the scariest sport in the world, man. Crazy. Crazy. Because it's like one of those things to where you can be on top and then you're like Nothing for such a short you. amount of time, yeah. you know? It's well, even like, if you're on top and everything's going good and everything's great. If you have a bad day or night going into that fight, your whole like the mindset, like so I think fighting while you're training is definitely 80% physical, you know, maybe even 90% physical, 10% mental. Day of the fight, it's like 90% mental. So the little voices in your head and the if eyes and should yous kick in and they overtake like me, my little weak-minded ass, it um sometimes would would ruin me in the cage. Like sometimes I could walk in there like shit in my corner and everyone knew like, man, you're not in the headspace. Yeah, you you're not there be. right now. And you're how fast, there. like, I mean, it can change in a moment, right? Sometimes like, the tides can definitely change. Like if you go in there on the bad side and all of a sudden make a couple good shots like oh yeah here we go starting and to get snap. real comfortable and then yeah get and caught up in something motherfucker snap back yeah let's go so yeah. the difference i mean you fought so many times cowboy so the difference of when you go in and you're mentally there versus not like what has been what what triggered you in each was it a night's sleep was it just i wish your i had opponent? The, i wish i knew i wish right. i had the, i wish i had the remedy to spill on this table right here, but you asked me, what is the fights when you're in the flow state and it feels like you are yeah. looking at yourself from third person playing yourself on a fucking video game? Yeah. You are untouchable. Right. Literally everything you do, um, it is the coolest feeling out there. Like when you're like nothing, doesn't matter what they do, you can you can have an answer for it. And again, I'm sure snowboarding, you felt that when you're like, man, I can't mess up right now. Like everything, you, you think about the trick, it just comes out flawless. You're like, nailed it, you know? And then some days you feel like you're stuck in second gear, grinding, grinding, grinding. And no matter what you try to do, it just doesn't come out right. I don't know. I think it's- Yeah, it's no, I've had some days where it was really interesting because you say that, but it was like almost my mind went blank. Sure. Like I'd go into a run and be like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And then I get into it and it's probably similar to fighting, right? Where your energy gets drained. But mm. for us, it's like, you got to remember to breathe. And there's sure. times where I don't. Or didn't. And I remember one time I got to the bottom and I just like landed one of the best runs of my life, but I couldn't even remember it. I was like, wait, what happened? Like I kind of blacked out. Sure. Memory wise, because you're just putting everything into it. You're not really like storing the data. Right. Did um, you ever find meditations help or did you get into that at all? No, not, not really a meditation guy, but I, I talked to sports psychologists and psychologists and what can I do and what's the, what's the ways to get these red light thoughts out of my head and it's crazy because I sit back now and I can, it's easy to do, you know, it's, it's, uh, I do a lot of snowmobiling now and a lot of mountain biking. Like if you're hauling ass down a run and you're like, don't hit the rock, don't hit the rock, don't hit the rock. 
you hit the rock. You're going right? to hit the rock. Hit the rock. If only we could address life like that, like hit the jump, hit the jump, hit the jump, 100 foot, bang, bang it. Go to, you know, if you could just think in positive thoughts all the time, it'd make things so much better and easier, but you don't. Your mind works so weird. It's always, always the opposite. Like if you're on a, on an icy road, you're like, don't hit the brakes, don't slide, don't slide, don't. And then, then you go slide into the ditch. But if you're like, fucking, let's go, rally, 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 right? You take the corner. Gas just, on, you're good. Gas on, let's go. It's just weird how <laughs> how your brain works. But they think that's why they teach you meditation, though, because when you me learn to meditate, you can select your thoughts, like you select your clothes, right? Like you can kind of just you you live in a state of that selective thinking of what you really want to think about. So true, but how easy is it to select yeah, tell your them. clothes? Tell her, Miss da uh, David Goggins. Can you? Can you, <laughs> yeah. can you just, I mean, I can't you know picture I mean? you just sounds like nice over here. Hey. I know. I can't picture That's her walking the over the closet and always being like, "Oh, this will work tonight. Yeah. Hey, oh, that'll go perfect." Shirt out. You know just I mean? fine. Good question. Uh, good question for <laughs> Cowboy. What kind of sled are you riding? Uh, free ride by um, Skidoo. Sick. Yeah, uh, BRP Can Am. So yes, sir. What it's size a, track? It's a, a 160. Two, I believe. Yeah, they don't have a sixty-five. It's a one sixty-two, and it is motherfucking go time. I've yeah. seen you. I've seen some footage of you. You do not hold back out there. No, I love it. It's the fun. My groin right now is so pulled, um, ripped. I got to go get surgery on it. You see me hobbling around a little bit. Yeah, I pull. I tried to put my leg. I was teaching my buddy how to do a sick power turn, like get into his trees and you turn, drop a leg. This is what you do. I dropped my leg. The sled went. My leg stayed deep in the snow, and the sled just banana peeled me. <laughs> I thought I dislocated my hip and I was laying there like, oh my God, I was a little hurt. But it turned out it was just uh ripped the old wiener muscle off. Dang. Wow. How yeah. fun is it digging sleds out? It's, it's <laughs> my favorite thing is to do is bring people that have never been. Right. Oh yeah. And they're like, this is gonna be so easy. And then you take them and, and you don't make it 10 feet out of the parking lot. And they've already been stuck three times digging out and you're just sitting there laughing. I love it. We had a moment in Alaska where I basically, me and Danny were doubling up this crazy steep in Alaska and I was like whining and I was just like, just leave me here, man. Just yeah, he's trying to give up. We're having the talk on the way up. I'm like, don't let go. He's like, well, I'm, uh, and I'm like, no, stay on. He's like, you're not going to make it. I'm like, definitely not if you let go. Like, stay on. Just he's leave like, me. He's like, just leave me here. And that's how I used to train for a lot of us. We'd go up sledding and I would take people that weren't very good and yeah. I had to get up sled, run over to them, get them unstuck, pull them out and like, 10,000 feet altitude and you're just working your ass off. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not an easy sport. Did you, um, uh, obviously growing up in Colorado, uh, and then training, do you think it helped like training in the altitude like oh, that? Of course. Yeah. I, um, I, my ranch is at like 74,000. So I kind of blood doped in a sense my whole life. Cause yeah. I just lived at that altitude. So yeah, when you go down to Vegas, which is 2000 or you go down to sea level, yeah, you feel like you got a whole nother gear. It's cool. Your so recovery that, time. That's BMF Ranch. Yes, sir. What year did you start that? Oh, man. Two, maybe 10. 2010? 10-ish, yeah, 2010. And it's essentially, um, obviously, a ranch with everything on it, but then you also, it's a training facility, correct? correct? Not anymore. It used to be. Now oh, it used just, to be. Now uh, my, my gym and cage is a giant playground for, has blow up, uh, like, bouncy houses and swords and balls. It's like a giant kid's playground now but it used to be yeah it's like a modern day fantasy factory oh yeah that that, that for sure yeah we got racetracks shooting ranges yeah, it's it's and my grandpa is the person who bought me the property and he tried to buy me in leadville which is the highest city in the u.s and uh i was like grandpa no one will come up here like are you crazy i couldn't get someone to come up here and now i wish i would have but uh back then i guess hindsight it's wild. I love it. And what was, did you, you help train fighters too when you were in there? Or I did. Yeah. We had a lot of people come up there and train and build them like, um, yeah, you're Rodriguez. We call him Chilito. Uh, but, uh, he is now the interim 145 champ. And it's so cool to see him go from just sleeping in my house to where he is now. Yeah. It's incredible. But yeah, tons of guys have come through and whether they're there to help me train, we have full um, like dorms there, a bunch of different like hotel rooms, and and uh, that we build a giant facility to house everybody. And I just never wanted people to come out and train with me and have to sleep on a couch. So they all had their own bedrooms and yep. kitchens. And yeah, was, what was, time are you waking people up on the BMF ranch? Uh, well, usually we had whatever the first practice was nine o'clock, or and we did it all in house. And we'd go. I taught what I my favorite part about it was I. would teach them how to live. Like, yeah, we're out here to train, but we're not just shutting our lives off. We're going to go ride bikes. We're going to go snowmobile. We're going to go shoot guns. We're going to go out down in town and have some beers and let loose. So that was, 
as a mentor, you're talking about what are the things to do, yeah. trying to teach these people not just to shut their life off and yeah. uh, live a little. That's so important, right? Like I think, you know, like so many, uh, we, we were talking about this earlier, but so many people get stuck in their way of these people today, especially professional athlete, athletes, oh, yeah. they're like robots, you know, and there's, there's so much, there's a lot of money on the line and it's a big corporate business, whichever business it is to somebody. Um, and these people kind of forget to live a little. And sure. I think, um, you know, I think during your career, I've, I've seen you out, out and about and you're having a beer. You're not getting fucking sloshed drunk or whatnot, right. but you're still enjoying life a little. Yes. Uh, and I think that's something that you, you did, which is really important to be able to pass that along is, is awesome. Now you look at the other, on the other side of the coin, like, would I have been a better athlete? Would I have been better in the UFC if I would have just let it absorb my entire life and put everything I had into it? Probably. But would I have been as happy and enjoyed the journey as much as I do now? No way. There's no way. You're living authentically, cowboy. Like you've always been that thrill, like that rush. That's just who you are at nature. So I think being authentic to who you are is, I mean, that's what we're all here for. You're like a poster child for America. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. He's like Chuck Norris to you me. You know what right I mean? Now, but he's like the real deal. <laughs> you one. see this guy at a NASCAR and he's Bud Light t shirt with a beer and he's cowboy hat on. And you're like, there's America. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's what people want. I mean, they want to be able to connect with these athletes, they want to be able to see them be themselves too, sure. you know, and to make a career, you know, it takes more than just being great. Absolutely. You know? Obviously you've been a part of uh, fighting your whole life and then a huge part of, of UFC. Uh, what, what do you think the future is for, for MMA and the future of, of UFC? Is the, the kids that are coming up that are learning MMA. Now it's so accessible, like wrestling, jujitsu, whatever striking discipline they want. They're like five, six years old coming up doing it it's insane man that's what i was thinking right because you make these sports so popular and all of a sudden the parents who then have kids are like putting them into it and i couldn't imagine like being five years old and being they're so good at every discipline of the sport world when i started it was like you were good at jujitsu you were good at striking you were a good wrestler and um so it was, it was like stylistically and matchups makes fights as they always preach like because they would want to put the strikers with the strikers or let the wrestlers and the, re the re jujitsu guys go right but yeah now that's where it, it's so amazing now how good and well ran these kids that are coming up are going to be who um uh coming up right now like who who do you have your eye on or or who do you think's come up fast that is uh kind of the next you know big thing um and when i was training over at syndicate there's a couple of these Spanish kids that are unbelievable. One was, he just signed, I don't know what his name is, but the youngest, he's like the youngest fighter in or in the UFC, he just went and won his fight. It was like, yep, I knew you were going to be fucking great just training with you. But his parents, again, put him all these, I think they even like homeschooled him or pulled him out of school and like, this is what we're going to have you do, right? And yeah, the proof is in the pudding because he went and did it. That's pretty wild because, I mean, us growing up, it was like we were disciplined, like, don't go out there and get into a fight. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, don't, you better not come home from school with a black eye again. Man, you the know? world's now changing. It's, like, it's insane. Like, remember, we'll yeah. also think, like, we're, this is streaming on Twitch. Yep. Which is a gaming. Yep. Yep. There's, like, money. Like, when you're like, oh, you'll never make any money playing games. And the, and the kid's like, mom, I just bought you a new fucking house. Yeah. Uh, you know what I was doing? Playing Call of Duty. So, yeah. uh, crazy. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's wild. Yeah. Wild. Um, uh, internationally, I feel like it's grown. Like, uh, you know, where I'm from in Australia, they're able to fucking. Oh, you're Australian. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the second time today. It's the second time. He was joking though. <laughs> Apparently, I'm. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> we got to send him back. Get yeah, thick fine. in the accent. God damn. Um. Uh. The fight. The fight. The fights last week were in London, but internationally, I feel like it's, it's, it's still. Oh yeah, man. When I used to go over like kickbox over in Europe and Japan, it was insane how big the it is over there. Way time like when I was kickboxing in Europe or when I was kickboxing in Japan, people knew what was going on. Back in America, you're like, oh yeah, I kickbox is like you do what? Yeah. Like what is kickboxing? I'm like, well, it's like boxing with kicks, kind of. And they're like, oh sick. Well, where do you do that at? I'm like, well, I gotta go to Europe because no one here knows anything about it. So <laughs> Uh, what other like countries are just mega fans? Uh, definitely Japan. Um, man, probably when I fought in Morocco, Africa, it was insane at the really? turnout there. Yeah, it was wild, wild, wild. Yeah, all over, all over 
everywhere but here. Pretty yeah, much. South yeah. America. Yeah. Like, what about Brazil? Of course. I mean, Brazil was all the jiu when that started growing and the sport started getting huge. I mean, you when you go over there as a, with a UFC or as a UFC fighter, man, you can't even walk yeah. around, move. Yeah, they're, it's insane. Insane. But It would probably, there's probably more fans. It's probably the biggest in Brazil, I would say. Yeah, could you could definitely rally that. You know, you forget how big Brazil is. You know, a lot of fucking people there. It's almost as big as uh, Australia, huh? Kind of, but just we have no people there. <laughs> <laughs> where did you, is there somewhere where you wish you ha- had a fort where you didn't fight? Mm, no. I've, yeah, I've, I've been all, I've nailed all those uh, check marks off. But Australia is probably one of my favorite parts. The, probably the best experience I had in Australia was landed. There was a, a UFC fight going on, and I got on social network and said, hey, any of y'all fuckers want to come have a beer with me? Let's go. And we just did like a pub crawl for eight <laughs> hours and just walked around and just got to experience uh, all the all the good times. There you go. Well, there's probably – well, I'm, I'm sure they really liked you there. Yeah, they, they – you, you fuckers can uh, almost drink as good as Americans. So it was fun. I, sometimes we can do a little better, but not all the time. <laughs> They're pretty good. They're definitely pretty good. Yeah, in we we don't we don't got much else to do there. Was there anybody that you never got to fight that you wish you could have fought? Mm, no, nah, I've pretty much ticked that off just accidentally being the guy they'd call when someone didn't have a fight. So, yeah, I just did you ever turn down a fight? <laughs> no. no, never. No. <laughs> do you ever yeah. like? Does anyone ever approach you to like try and pick a fight? Like outside? Like, yeah, like outside no. in the bar and the vibe. No, I think I kind of have a a look to me that they either they already know what they're doing and they're coming to look for trouble or they they are like eh, probably shouldn't that guy looks like he doesn't really want to fuck around but uh haven't no couldn't tell you the last time i had an incident with that so not much has your size changed like now that you don't on steroids yeah (laughs) yeah a lot i put on 50 pounds no you did really yeah oh yeah what do you weigh right now 208 to six right around there Nice. Yeah. And the steroids is nice. Lo- yeah, I feel like I'm a kid. Now, I do understand why in professional sports you cannot use steroids because you feel like an animal. You could literally, for one, I feel like a kid again. Like you're like, oh, this is what it's like to wake up and feel good. Right. And not sore. And you could go in the gym and work out as hard as you want, whether it be jujitsu, tr- any, any discipline you want. And you go to bed and wake up like, I'm hmm, not even sore. I don't even feel tired. Like it's incredible. Wow. So, yeah, I get it. And I love it. And uh, everyone's all like, I can't believe you would do steroids. And I'm like, why? My entire life I played by the rules. So why, by wh- the why would people be mad at you for doing steroids? Just uh, they, because- well, in this world we're in right now, like people are like try and pretend like, oh, I'm natty. I do all like, well, I don't care if you are or not. I'm not. I, you know, right. I have no problem just openly saying that. Like, it doesn't bother me. Who's the guy that said he was it the, the, liver, the liver guy oh yeah it did, super natty right did, he did, def- didn't, didn't he get blasted recently for yeah, he got busted for uh and he's on the on the super set of shit yeah he they they, they finally got figured out what he was on it's uh it's a hell of a dose but and it wasn't just buffalo liver no it wasn't it wasn't liver yeah <laughs> no, i don't think liver, liver had, had some of the things he was taking <laughs> Yeah, I don't understand. Like, I get in, um, you know, at a, at a professional level, why people would get tested and do it all. But if you, well, if I mean, look at Alistair Overeem. You remember when he fought Brock and he was just shredded and yoked, and you're just like, wow, how do you look like a Greek god right now? And uh, he's like, oh, it was just must have been in the horse meat I got. They must have <laughs> must, have, must have got one of those super juiced up racing horses. Like, oh well, do you have any extra? Because I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, many injuries. I know there was you had one huge ATV uh, right. accident. Um, uh, did that leave you with long lasting uh, any effects or any? Nah, I mean your body's amazing. It heals up pretty good, but my wrists are pretty bad. You know, just from years of punching, I have like super bad wrists. Tried everything you can do. I just got to get surgery on them. When so you need to go. put the little pin in there. Well, but yeah, they got to take a couple bones out. Like, how far can you bring your hand back? Well, one's worse than the other. See, my I, I have the same. Like, if yeah, I ride like, a snowmobile can't. now. For yeah, like, like it's you go. See, yeah. Can I, I, you guys, that's all I got right there. That's yeah, that's the all the way movement. back. Is that when the, I, when uh, I wave, what? I'm like, ooh, like I can't have no, have no back and forth movement. <laughs> so, like, it's like, <laughs> 
But uh, so yeah, they got to take some bones out, and I don't, I have no idea. I won't ever get it done. But right, so a lot of a, a lot of pro uh, motorsports from well, typically mo- mo- motorbikes. A lot of the supercross guys, I forget what bone it's called, but they scaffold put, this one right here. Yeah, yeah. and then they put like a little uh, pin in there because it's crazy that um, you have a bad a bad wrist like that, yeah. and then you snowmobile and mountain bike. Well, snowmobile's thumb, but when I ride uh, quads or dirt bikes, yeah, I just do the. The reach down snap effect, yeah. So I get full, full, yeah, full, full throttle. Oh, all the yeah, time. all the time, full pin. I was interested that you're uh, super into mountain biking, and it, it's crazy because a lot of people don't realize how dangerous mountain biking is. Well, that's why I did it, not not because of the dangerous aspect, but but for the we'd always ride up. We wouldn't just downhill, right? Like you ride a ski lift up and downhill, and we'd ride up the hills, which was a crazy workout and physical drain. But then after you're so physically drained and your mind's weak and you're tired, now you got to go down. So you have to think about all these split second decisions while you're in fatigue. And that's what I would use for when you want to make those crazy decisions when you're fighting and you're tired and you don't not thinking clear, like, is the risk worth the reward? So that was the that's why we did it. Wow. And have you had many mountain bike like inc- like crashes? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Over the the scorpions. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Of course. Because it's not about if it happens. It's just, it's when. the thing that when that just continuously happens. Yeah, because you get a little more, with anything in life, you get a little bit better. And as you get better, the you just progressively start riding more gangster shit. Pretty soon you're on the good shit. And then those little accidents happen. And they usually are big because the rate of speed and the terrain you're on. Yeah. yeah. You is, get wadded. Is, <laughs> are you jumping as well? Everything. Fuck. Doing it all. The downhill is for one okay. It's I'm not on a, a BMX that you get in from Walmart. Okay. We didn't we didn't wish.com the BMX bike we're riding, right? So we they're like set up and they're incredible bikes and they can take a lot. And yeah. once you learn that you can just kind of pinch your asshole and really just uh, go for it, <laughs> you, you're, you're all right. So that's how you stay on the bike. You just got to pinch you your really asshole, man. Pinch that, yeah, you suck really, that thing in. Really just, like, Whoa. It scares the shit out of me because I grew up, you know, snowboarding down all these runs and then you get on a bike and you're like, oh my God, I'm mm-hmm. so scared. I'm going like 15 yes. miles so an hour. So the term, it's like riding a bike. You're like, motherfucker, it's not like it's riding not. a bike. I don't even remember how to ride a bike. Right? Yeah. 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 It's not the same thing. Yeah. It, uh, it's good shit. <laughs> But, but it's cool that all this terrain's opened up with all the ski resorts, like in the summer. Yeah, that everyone's now starting to, to. Oh yeah, they've turn adapted it. to it. Why not? For yeah. one business plan, why is like, hey, all winter we're killing it. Yeah. Might as well sell nineteen dollar beers and eighteen dollar pizzas all day long during the summer too. Might yep. as well double fuck them, right? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they spawned up real quick. I think yeah. every mountain now yeah. is open pretty much year round. But they say so it's actually better in the summer. Oh, I like the mountain towns in the yeah, summer. Like Mammoth in, in, in the summertime, hiking up to the lakes. Fuck, this yeah. summer, no ma- no mountain time. Well, they'll just have snow. It, it'll yeah. like listen. It's gonna melt out quicker. Like once that heat hits it, yeah, it's it. But they'll they're it's gonna have be a like lot in of snow. August. Yeah, is it still snowing in New Mexico? It's dumping right now. Crazy dumping. dumping yeah. And it's, apparently, like the um, like the the shift that's come in this winter and New Mexico is probably going right through it. It usually comes up what's, higher. What's and that, the ship? The shift. Spaceship. The shift. Oh, it's a spaceship. jet stream. But no, they call it a, what is it, an astrospheric river? Well, the, the... That sucks all the moisture in in one direction. Well, usually apparently it, goes, it comes in from the Gulf of uh, Texas. Hmm. It comes up through and it usually hits like Jackson, Colorado, Park City, like gets the bulk of it. For whatever reason, we're lower. And then that's why California and probably New Mexico and whatever's hmm. in the route of it's been getting dumped on. I'm not love complaining. It. I love it. Yeah. Let it snow. Let it snow. Hunting. Hunt. Hunting. Hunting. Hunt. Shooting. Shooting. What do you what do you prefer to hunt? What's your favorite thing to hunt? Birds. Birds? Yeah. Any kind of birds. Turkey, pheasant, duck. Yeah, I like birds. How's like a standard like like shooting for birds? Are you out there for uh, uh, like all day? No. And I'm not a I don't like hunting because I don't like freezing my ass off. That's not you're talking about being cold. I don't like being cold mm-hmm. for no reason. Yep. And I don't like getting early to go do that. So we roll in high noon, shoot a couple birds, and go home. <laughs> and, and you eat the birds? Uh, that's a hard no. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. no, I'm not. The, I'm not the trophy. The trophy uh, guy to talk to about what you do when you're out there hunting. Yeah, bird. I mean, we eat the turkeys for sure, and the pheasants really good. But duck is like oily and yeah. Nah, a duck's hard to hit. No, pretty easy. Hard to cook. Hard to cook. Hard to cook. You just take the breast. Like you're wasting a lot of it anyway. So we just like to feed the coyotes anyways, which then we hunt them. So 
Are you fishing out there too? <laughs> don't fish. Don't enjoy it. No, I'm not. A, I'm not a. I'm not a drinking beer fish guy. Yeah, you kind of. You seem like the. Yeah, you. It's not. As, it's not as uh, extreme for you. No. I feel like. Now I've been tarpon fishing on a fly rod down in the Keys, and that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, because they come through and you're battling them on fly rods. And they're big, huge dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah dinosaurs. Yeah, it's cool. Fish are crazy. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, what is you know? So you've got. Your new movie's coming up. Yeah. You got your third kid. I heard I heard something. I heard that you did, uh, and this is from, from back here. Is this uh, that w maybe your first or second kid used to sleep with the light on? Me with the light on? Yeah. With no. the kid? Oh. oh. I got wrong information, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, I sleep with the light on. Yeah, no, they, uh, I sleep right now. We have the third baby and he stays in the room with mama and I sleep with the two boys. They have their own rooms, but they like to sleep together and then they like to fight the whole time. So I don't know why they <laughs> sleep together because they just want to bicker and argue the whole time. That's just then, what kids do. Yeah. And then they, then I sleep in there with them. So they, uh, yeah, there's no, there ain't no lights on in there. Do you think, uh, your kids will end up, uh, in the ring at some no. point? No, nah, I don't, I think they're going to. Do whatever they want. But if they want to, sure. But I've tried putting my kids in jujitsu and they weren't too excited about it. They didn't, but they're four. So it doesn't, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's good. you know, but yeah, they're, they're four, but they can fucking drive a can am. Yeah. I mean, they, they, that, right. I mean, that's, that he, he loves it and he's good at it. So he, he, every day he was like, daddy, can we, can we go race today? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. Come on. And we just go out there and he drives and I don't have to follow him anymore. He told me the other day, uh, daddy, I, I know where to go. It's okay. You can you can stay here. And we have a race shop with a big radio, so I can talk to him in the car. And he just says, "I'll be okay." That's and so he, cool. Yeah, it's super cool. I love it because now I can do other shit and I have to follow him around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you guys got we, we, he you got third in that race. Uh yeah, he took first. Little fucker win and won it, and then uh, yeah, we did correct. And then are you competing continuously in this Can-Am series? Yes. It's called Best in the Desert. Correct? Yeah. 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 We have a next race uh, in April and it's fun. It's like the wildest crazy. I mean, you literally have to drive. Like we just did the Mint 400 and it's 400 miles. That's so long. In a Can-Am too? Yeah, it's like six and a half hours of as fast and as hard as you can drive. Are you, uh, are you catheter? Oh yeah. hundred percent catheter. Yeah. I put... A catheter on, I feel like I have to pee right away. So I just, yeah, without it, I'd be, I'd be in a bind. Yeah. yeah. I find it hard pain in those things. Why? I don't know. For whatever reason, when I'm in a car bouncing along like that, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, and then when I do, I've had like an incident where I did the Baja and I just lost the catheter. So I sat in my piss for mm. a long time. I did that once. Yeah. I just peed <laughs> my pants. I didn't have a catheter. It wasn't an option. He might need a smaller catheter. <laughs> but then I went out with this guy the night before, and it was like, oh. And he's like, you know, you didn't drink water after 8 p.m., right? Yeah. And I'm like, no, I was drinking beers with my yeah, best right. friend all yeah. night long. And I'm hungover, so I'm going to bang a bunch yeah. of water down to even out. Yeah, yeah right? Have you ever uh, done any, like, Baja stuff, like oh, yeah, bigger we took, trucks? We took fifth in Baja. Uh, no, no, not bigger trucks. I was in a Can-Am again. Yeah. Uh, we took fifth last year in Baja, so. Oh, in the yeah. Can-Am? Yeah, in the in the Peninsula run. It was oh, shit. 36 How hours. Damn, and then... um. Uh, j just one driver. We had four drivers. You switch it out. Three drivers. You how big's a crew? Like when you're humongous, humongous, yeah, and hundreds of thousands of dollars. It yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, how much it takes to go into those races. But even uh, even up here, like the biggest race on America is called Vegas Reno. We literally race from Las Vegas to Reno, and it's like 660 miles, which is takes 12, 14 hours, and it's it's a long time in a car. Yeah. Well, especially in a car bouncing around on fucking, as fast as you can go. As like fast you can't, as you can go. you're just not on a Sunday cruise. You know, you're not foot up, cruise control. Yeah, you're turning, rumming everything you got. So you got to stay alert and awake. And do you have someone with you? Co driver. Yeah, my best yeah. friend Eric, my buddy. Eric. Yeah, one of my best friends. I called him and he's all into it. He loves it. What's <laughs> the uh, max speed of these Can Ams? Mm, Hundred and. Just, just over a hundred. They're still oh, moving. They're moving. Have you, have you seen or been, have you had any like kind of scary wrecks in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not scary because you're so protected. Like the, the amount of engineering that goes into them is unbelievable. And then the amount of like tech and contingency that you have to go to to make sure that you are safe, like helmets checked. Your everything has to be. Yeah, you're fine. You could. We've wadded it over a hundred. I mean, <laughs> man, you're just unbuckle and get out. Like, whew. 
Car is smoked, but we're good. <laughs> how's uh, how's Eric's tire changing skills? He's good. He's, he, yeah, he's, he, 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 he's good for sure. And uh, tires and belts. Yeah, that's what you gotta gotta be looking good at. Do you so. guys ever? Uh, do you guys? Uh, the the one thing I saw in Baja, which I thought was fucking crazy, and I saw a car blow up, and the guy survived, but just they call it a rolling stop where they don't stop, but they go in to get gas and they just keep moving and then they jump on. And you ever seen one of those like fail? No. I've never heard of that. I couldn't imagine. So in ba we were in Baja and this guy tried to do, he, uh, this guy tried to do like a rolling stop to where he kind of stopped, like didn't stop, but kept rolling. And then, uh, uh, they, they kind of drove next to him and tried to fill him up. Thing blew up. This dude ended up oh, rolling. Gas. Why yeah. wouldn't you just stop for 12 seconds and then dump fuel in there? Crazy, right? Trying to make that 10 seconds up, I guess. Stupid. If you're on Baja worried about 10 seconds, you've, Fucked up bad. Yeah, you yeah. got problems. Yeah, you got problems. Well, we did that trophy truck race, and I remember Pistol Pete, uh -huh. legendary dude. He made the guy and thing go up into the front and put oil into it. He's just while like, they're no. driving. While they're driving, he's like, "No, go add the oil." He's like, "All right, pull over." He's like, "No, go <laughs> add the oil." I'm like, climb out the window, and oil's just pouring him in the face. He's trying I mean, to pour it's like spilling it on the motor. And he's like, "Hey, Pistol Pete, this is not a good idea." Yeah, Pistol Pete won that race. Huh. Uh, Danny has his little lightning round. He'll start working on that. Do you have that in front of you? I do. I have some right here. I, I know you started working on it before we went well, live. Did. did you get rid of all the questions? No, no, I didn't. And someone asked in the chat, they want the lightning round. They get excited for this lightning round, so we have to do it. Yeah. So someone asked about um, Connor. He said, Cowboy, what do you think makes Connor especially dangerous in the octagon? Or was there anything that was surprising about your fight with him? Uh, he very dangerous because his mindset, like he's very good at becoming the person that he needs to become to engage and stay engaged in in the octagon at all times. So whoever he's talking to and whoever he's got his mind set to where he can charge forward like that all the time, that's he he's done I need I should probably call him like, hey man, what do you do to take the edge off? But he didn't surprise me. Then you talk about losing a fight before I walked in, that was one. Really? Oh fuck yeah. You, I was looking for the exit before I even walked in. It, wow. And yeah. you fought him at his peak. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and I would also say he fought me at my peak. Like, right. Yeah, I'm not making any excuses. Like, I was just, yeah, he went, he was ready and I was not. Yep. Yeah, of course. Man, and what he's done a lot for the sport too. It's it's globally, I, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think you'll see somebody um, as, you know, dominant, not, not just in their fighting, but what he did for, just not even fucking MMA, for all sports in general. Sure. You know, sure. it's, uh, it's really... Interesting and 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 again, like you know, uh, UFC has been very lucky to have those type of and and yourself. You know, it's again like I, I looking even on the rosters, like you want more Americans kind of coming up to the stars. It's it seems to be kind of all over the place now. Um, I got a question for you. What is the most important life skill MMA and martial arts have taught you? Oh, how to change a tire. How to change a tire. I, I'm actually, believe it or not, I can change a tire pretty yeah, I good. put a kid's camp on every year, like for underprivileged children, and that's one of the life skills we teach these kids, like how to change your oil, how to jump start your car if it dies, and how to change. Because I explain to these boys, like if you're 15, 16 years old, 17 year old, you're on a date with a girl, you don't want to be the guy that's got to call the tow truck, call another dude to come change your I tire. I did that once. I was like <laughs> one of my proudest moments ever. Uh, in Vermont, he's girl, like, so I crashed the car no, and then I called I this guy. We were going like 120 in Vermont, and she blew a tire out, and I was like, I got this. And it I was a Jetta, this. so yeah. it was like it was not the Jetta. easiest. It doesn't matter one. what car it is. You're like, hey, girl. I but I finished this. it, and I was like, proud moment. And the way she looked at me, yeah, was he was, like, he was, the, oh you were that God. dude. You, you did you, uh, yeah. did you get the? I lost my virginity to her. Well, not yeah, that for changing a tire. <laughs> Damn. So that's so, so you asked me again. What do I think the most important life skill is? There you go. Look at mm -hmm. proofs in the pudding. Isn't it crazy? The basics. It's like some of the simplest things are the most like meaningful. Sure. That you can carry through your whole life. Sure. Um, greatest pound for pound MMA fighter of all time. Mm, John Jones. Uh, your biggest battle outside of the octagon. Ooh, dealing with my demons. For mm -hmm. sure. In and my, you you said that you're- What about uh, diapers? No, I don't change diapers. Oh, okay. Yeah, mama's got that. Yeah, so that's a pretty big battle then for you too. Yeah, she, uh, that's it. <laughs> like if, they, if one of the boys come in like, I pooped, I'm like, sick, where's your mom? Let's get this, let's get this, let's get this, get this taken care of. <laughs> you said a little bit earlier that as you're getting older, that's become easier, like fighting your demons? Yeah, just that you learn to deal with them better. And I don't have like dark suicidal demons, but I'm, right. I'm just talking about, yeah, you're, just your everyday- when your mind tells you fucked up things and you got to tell it not to. So just, just dealing with those, you know, that for sure. As you get older, you learn. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think a big part of that is like, you know, also realizing that everyone has these demons in their head, you know, it's not just like, oh, I'm the only one dealing (laughs) with this. Everyone out there has, you know, a bad demon on one and a good one on other and Usually they're kind of talking and getting you in a lot of trouble. Too. Yeah, and the bad demon's usually the one you want to listen to. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, for sure. yeah, the one when you're like, I shouldn't eat the cake. And he's like, oh, you should definitely eat the cake. And you're like, yeah, we should eat the cake. <laughs> they, they speak louder than yeah. most. I like the comment boards going off with all these people going, I need to learn how to change a tire now. It's a lot of love from everyone coming out there. It's so awesome to have you on here. That's no, cool, man. I love it. And to be live because, you know, you're your reach and your fans are huge too, you know? I love it, man. It's, uh, I'm honored to, whenever I used to go out and people would like, do you ever get tired of taking pictures and talking to people like, nah, nah, I don't because one day they won't be there anymore. You know, one day this is the way the world is. You grow old, you, people forget about you. And so I used to stand there at autograph sessions. I mean, you remember, I'd be the only one standing there for hours after it was shut down. Just like, that's so important. Yeah, man. I mean, why not? They came all the way out here. The last thing I'm gonna do is like, Oh, 12 o'clock, oh, I got to go. Yeah we're, yeah, we're done here. Like, no, I'll stand there until everyone, everyone's done. And because one day they won't ask me again. But a lot of people don't do that. No. Nah. You know, it's yeah. it's, uh, it's 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 crazy to, mm-hmm. to, to think about that, To you know, that mo- most people won't, you know, to, to give two hours of your life to make somebody's day, yeah. year, whatever it sure. is. And a, a lot of these athletes and people, like, I've made my whole career trying to be the same person I am in the light as I am in the dark, you know, just in that – I don't ever want someone to meet me like, man, that guy was a piece of shit. Like, now I wanted them to go into it. Like, no, we we already knew he was a piece of shit. We were just confirming it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I want to make sure they, yeah, that, that I'm the same person they see no matter what. And you are. I know. I've known you a long time, cowboy. And behind closed doors, he is exactly what he portrays on camera. When they do the one-on-one interviews, that is exactly how he feels, how he thinks, and it's nothing is a show. Like he, you embody. Right. A showman, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's what you see is what you get. What you yeah. see is what you get. You know, yeah. and, and that's awesome. You know, it's uh, so many times it's the opposite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, put it on the facade. Yeah, but hey. Someone uh, wants here's... to know your favorite special operations unit. Actually, that's a good one. Ooh. Well, I was unsure about that question at first, but then I went and did a hunt. You were talking about hunting. It was, yep. a, it was a bird hunt we just did in Texas. And I was with um, the guy that killed Osama bin Laden. Oh shit. So we were drinking beers after the hunt, of course. <laughs> and I'm like, I gotta, I gotta know. I gotta ask this dude all these questions. Like every question you could think of, I asked. And I was like, what? Really? What? It was so just by talking to him and getting his state of mind and how they you know, I think like the special ops guy, like the Navy SEAL guys, man, they there there was 24 of them that went in there and every one of them knew that they weren't coming home. And I was like, You that was your mindset going in? That's like crazy. You know what I mean? Like, and they were like and when he went up the stairs to take the shot, it was just two of them. And he's like, my guy was squeezing my back. Like, let's go. And he's like, yeah, but is there anybody else uh, coming with us? Like, and he's like, let's go. And he's like, fuck it. So we had made our way up the stairs. And he said the coward put his wife in front of him. And he was no. like, oh, yeah. He said, and Zalman put, put, I don't know her name, but a wife in front of him. And they had a translator said, we're not here for you. You're free to leave. As soon as she stepped, gave him the old double tapper. And uh, Dang. Yeah, it was, it was. I'm telling you, every question I could think yeah. of. And then, cool. Do we have time? Yeah, we got time. The coolest part was when they they crashed the helicopter, and he was explaining about their super secret helicopter. It's not the Black Hawk. Did they it's crash a, it on the way in or the yeah, way on out? The way in. Yeah, crazy. And um, I'll get back to the crash of the helicopter. But they, it's like I'm going to breach the door. I send my breacher up. He puts the C6 on the door, and I was like, "What is C6?" And he goes, "Oh, it's two more times awesome than C4." And I was like, "Fuck yeah, it is. <laughs> of course it is." <laughs> Of course it is. It was like, so we blow the door and it was a fake door. So everybody knew we were there now. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, so we make our way down and we see a glove stick out of the door. It was our own team. And um, they meet, reunite with the other team. And they're like, hey, we have a problem. They have a mocked up design of our super secret helicopter in the front yard. And they were like, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, that's ours. Like they had, it's like, oh yeah, we. That was actually us. They don't, have, they don't know, they don't know what we're flying at. You know what I mean? But it was, just, it was just funny how. Yeah. He, he was very um, colorful in the way he described. Yeah. It was, um, but like I said, every question you could want to ask, I fucking ask. So that's amazing. When we get off the air, if you guys want to know some fucking cool shit, I'll let yeah, you. Yeah, we know. can keep going. I mean, I'm in on that one. <laughs> uh, Brittany, any last things? 
Um, no, it's good to see you. Congratulations on baby number three. Are we Thank going you. for baby number four? We're going for baby number four. Got to get a girl in there. Got to get a girl. <laughs> I think I'm going to Africa. Um, the wife's kind of done with the pregnancy. So I think I'm going to go to like Africa or a third world country and adopt a little girl. And oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah just uh, I want one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's really awesome. Bring one out of the mud and bring her to the light. So let's go. Well, congrats on uh, an amazing career. We love you at Monster Energy and good luck continuing on the Can-Am career and racing and having fun. Uh, sledding, uh, mountain biking, and of course your movie career, dude. Yes, what a sir. fucking, what an honor it is to have Donald Taroni, the cowboy, in Monster HQ today. So we appreciate you. Uh, Brittany and Danny, as always, that's a wrap. Woo! Woo!